All right, we're going to finish this up strong. There, there's a little bit of a shift here in, in terms of uh, uh, the content of what we're going to talk about. And so uh, um, Dan Resnick, unfortunately, uh, became a victim of the commercial airline industry and couldn't join us. So we have one fewer speaker in this last session. And uh, I'm going to uh, begin, and then a Adam Cantor is going to follow me. But what I'm going to talk about is really a reflection of, uh, of, of a team effort and a collaborative effort that I think would make Peter Janetta proud uh, that has been ongoing since 2008 uh, between Adam Cantor and myself. And, and the team keeps growing, and Kojo's uh, arrival in Pittsburgh is helping us to expand these concepts into more and more of the spine. Um, but for us, the great thing is that um, we're trying to change the way that this is practiced, not just locally, but on, on a global basis. And in modern times, that often requires working with, with other institutions, which we are actively doing. But the idea here is that uh, scoliosis surgery has matured pretty dramatically over the last three or four decades from the Harrington Rod era. And, uh, and now we're in a position to take it even further. And we want to get to the point that we can do these things um, we can't quite do everything through a less than two inch incision, Dr. Joe, but we're getting there. And a lot of what we do is through an incision that's two inches or less. Um, but the good thing is that, uh, that, that when we achieve success in these endeavors, it's better for the patients um, and, and, and the outcomes are equivalent with uh, a lower risk profile. So these are my uh, disclosures. We had an interesting thing happen uh, over the last uh, few years where we actually lost three giants in neurosurgery. And these three gentlemen, Al Roten, John Jane, and Peter Janetta, were all born within eight months of each other and all died within eight months of each other. And if you think through the impact that, that, that Dr. Janetta has had on trainees on the field and on patients, and then you think through what the three of these gentlemen have done it is genuinely a global uh, impact. And for me, I, I represent the bridge um, between the, the, the two gentlemen on the left. Um, Juan Fernandez, Miranda in our department, represents uh, the bridge between Al Roten and, uh, and Peter Janetta. Um, and uh, actually, if you look carefully at our department, there is an incredible percentage of people who have a tie to the University of Virginia who are on faculty here between Ray Sekula, Mark Richardson, Kojo Hamilton, Adam Cantor, myself, Dade Lunsford, who likes to um, uh, poo poo that to a certain, he likes to hide that fact a little bit. He talks about Columbia, not so much about his relationship with UVA, but the ties are incredibly strong. And those ties are a reflection of the impact that, uh, that our mentors have had, uh, had on us. All right, when we talk about MIS spine surgery, um, one of those categories is the kinds of things that Dr. Joe has been pursuing for a long time, where you do these minimally invasive decompressions. Um, then we went through this era of what we were doing, what we call hybrid surgery, where a portion of it is minimally invasive and a portion of it is done open. And then, uh, and now we're, we're getting to the point that we can do what we call CMIS procedures, which are circumferential minimally invasive surgery, where uh, whichever vector it is that you're taking to the spine, it's all being done with a minimally invasive approach. Irrespective of the approach that you take for scoliosis surgery, the goals are the same. You have to decompress neural elements and negate the pain generators. You have to restore or maintain spinal balance, and you have to get fusion. And this restoration or maintenance of spinal balance is really at the crux of everything that we do. And whatever approach is used in scoliosis, what we've learned is that if you screw up that middle bullet point, then you actually render the patient with a lifelong disability that can only be addressed by further, larger, um, and more invasive surgery. So the middle bullet point is the absolute key to success, that you have to either maintain or restore the normal adult posture. And we've learned a tremendous amount about what are the factors that you have to measure inside um, the spine in order to understand what the goals of surgery are. Uh, and that understanding has what has driven the, the evolution of scoliosis surgery. But it wasn't until we found the proper MIS techniques and the proper adjuvant technologies that let us achieve this 
um, that we could get to the point that we achieved in 2016, which, which was an inflection point for us in arriving at a moment where minimally invasive scoliosis surgery was truly possible. So what has been the evolution of scoliosis surgery over those 30 years? Well, it started with Jurgen Harms um, being a major pioneer of anterior surgery, the old shark bite incision or transthoracic approaches. You know, Chris Shaffrey kind of took the mantra of that, but it's really Jurgen Harms who, um, who was the pioneer of this anterior approach to scoliosis surgery. This is primarily done in, uh, in adolescence, but there is a fair amount of morbidity associated with this procedure, as you can imagine. So then came the Larry Lanky era, uh, where Larry Lanky said, I can do everything posteriorly. I don't need to do anything anteriorly. Larry Lanky says he hasn't done an anterior approach sin since the year 2000. And Larry Lanky taught us precisely how to, how to address this condition through posterior-only approaches, and he has been remarkably successful at it. And there is a reason why he has been the standard bearer for this field for quite some time. Well, then there was this little Brazilian dude, Luis Pimenta, who came along and said, you know what, I can actually introduce a minimally invasive procedure that goes through a lateral approach, goes through the psoas muscle, gets to the spine, and I can achieve all those things that we, we've listened to Jurgen Harms and others describe through a tiny little incision. And that heralded uh, this evolution from large open procedures into the dawn of the minimally invasive era. And in fact, the transoas approach that Luis Pimenta pioneered is the modern anterior approach. And we can achieve a lot by, by these anterior procedures, which uh, Adam Cantor is going to discuss in a minute. But just through these anterior minimally invasive procedures alone, we can begin or even sometimes in isolation achieve the goals of surgery. And then that brought us into the era of doing these hybrid approaches where we would start the surgery with a minimally invasive approach from the side led by Adam Cantor, and then we would flip the patients over and do these large open procedures with instrumentation and correction um, and, the, and achieving those uh, spinal balance parameters necessary through these large open posterior approaches. The fact of the matter is that that didn't take it far enough. So then there were a few other developments over the last 10 years that have been critical. And, and the first of these two examples, uh, of these two advances has really been led by Reg Hade, um, who uh, is a Pittsburgh kid, actually. And, uh, and Reg has really been the person who has reintroduced the A-lift. The A-lift fell, fell out of favor. And Reg reintroduced the ALIF, but also really started to drive the design of implants that would maximize the benefits of ALIFs in these modern times. And again, you get huge fusion rates, large foot plates with these modern designed implants. And now we can do that through these tiny little mini anterior approaches, often done through, through a very small fan and steel approach. So it's be, uh, below the bikini line since, since the vast majority of our patients are female. Um, everything old is new again. And then came Juan Uribe and really Greg Mundus as well out of San Diego, um, who introduced this concept of the anterior column reconstruction where you cut the ALL, which is a daunting task through a minimally invasive approach when you're three millimeters from the aorta, but you cut the ALL and then you can achieve uh, these very powerful corrections at an individual level. So if we have to stand someone up and we have to induce 30, 40 more degrees of lordosis in their lumbar spine, which has typically been done through an open approach that involves three liters of blood loss. Now we can do it through a tiny little incision and 50 cc's of blood loss with these modern anterior column reconstruction techniques. And the adoption of these techniques into our practice um, is the last piece that was necessary for us to get to the point that the percentage of procedures that could be addressed with minimally invasive techniques finally really started to grow. So the last part is that we have to, if we're going to do this, it's got to be right. And, uh, and as Larry Lanky has, has said on numerous occasions, in fact, at, at, at the Spine Summit last year, Larry Lanky was, was uh, participating in a debate about anterior versus posterior surgery, and he points down to Adam Cantor and me and says, look, we're debating this, but if this ever has to happen to me, I want it done by those guys. 
because he doesn't even want the operation that he has pioneered and, and perfected, frankly, um, and does every single day. He's like, I'm waiting for these guys to get it right, and then I want it done the way that they do it. And in order to get it right, when we're doing things blindly, we need uh, stuff to help us. And Dade showed a slide of this earlier that you know he really uh, understood the value of a CAT scanner inside of the operating room for neurosurgery, and this, CAT scanner, which Dade Lunsford had installed in Presby um, shortly before I got here, has been an incredible um, help to us so that we get it right, that we have the right technology, we have the right tools where we can um, deliver precision through blinded um, approaches, and we use this for both open and minimally invasive surgery, but now we have navigation, CT guidance, and, and the tools, technologies, and implants that, um, that allow for these minimally invasive techniques to actually be correct. Um, so now we're at a point where uh, we have the right understanding, the right techniques, and the right technologies, and then the last piece of that uh, additional technology is working with companies to um, bring us even more things. So now we're using this, this thing where you can capture the points, you dial in the points, you can then say, this person has a 34 degree curve, but I want my rod to be eight degrees, and we teach the software that, and then we create a rod that is precisely what we want it to do, and then we can feed that in through a minimally invasive approach, no open incision, no muscle takedown, and we are delivering precisely what it is that we want, because we understand from our preoperative measurements that I need for this person with 50 degrees of pelvic incidence, I need 47 degrees of lumbar lordosis. I'm going to tolerate eight degrees of a coronal cob angle because that's going to achieve my, my center sacral vertical line, putting my head in exactly the right place. And now, uh, and, and now this is what we're doing. And this is what we call circumferential minimally invasive scoliosis surgery. We really reached the point that we were able to do this on a large percentage of our patients um, back uh, in 2016, that you can do a tiny little incision on the side, you can do these stab incisions through the back, and it's substantially superior from a morbidity perspective to the classic open uh, posterior approach. We've worked with um, a group of key centers across uh, the country who are also pursuing these techniques. We group our data um, and we are now starting to deliver the data to the literature all on minimum two-year outcome data um, where we are showing that we are at least equivalent to open posterior approaches for um, success. And then uh, I'll just leave you with two examples. So here's a 55-year-old lady with progressive uh, curvature and pain. We can apply these techniques and we can get to the point that we can deliver her solution with 100 cc's of blood loss and basically no incision. And the same thing um, with, uh, with this person, another 59-year-old female with severe unrelenting back pain. You can see that she's stooped forward, which we know is associated with something very bad. This would typically require an open procedure called a subtraction osteotomy that typically loses two liters of blood in and of itself, and now, with Dr. Cantor, we can do an anterior column reconstruction, we can lose 20 cc's of blood, and we can stand her up and give her the exact posture that she needs and restore her quality of life in a powerful way. So now that we have these minimally invasive techniques, we now have a modern deformity surgery practice that involves minimally invasive solutions. Um, and you know, the reminder and the take home message is that the best way to, to do something is the way that you do it best. And fortunately for us, this is becoming the best way for us to do these things. It's great for us, it's great for the patients, and it, it is uh, indicative of the legacy of Peter Janetta that as a department we should be pushing the, uh, pushing the bounds and always trying to get better. Thank you.